Hey guys, this episode we're gonna be diving into a little series on building an API wrapper Ruby gem. What we've got here is the Vulture version two API, and this is new and um, something that we haven't integrated with yet in Hatchbox. So I've been building a wrapper around the version two API. Um, we previously had one for the old version one API, and we wanna be able to upgrade to the new one. So what we're gonna do in this series is build a Ruby gem that has an interface to connect with the Vulture API. If you aren't familiar with Vulture, they are a hosting service, so you can spin up servers, Kubernetes clusters, load balancers, firewalls, and add your domains uh, to their DNS system. They can do pretty much everything that like a DigitalOcean um, could do as well. So we're gonna be building a wrapper for this and making it easier to work with in Ruby. So um, one question that I wanna address real quick before we dive in is, what is an API? Uh, and it confuses people a lot of times, but it's actually very simple. So when you're in your browser and you visit a web page, you go to a URL and you say, hey, I want um, some data back, I wanna see that page, or you submit a form and you send data to the server. APIs are exactly the same, but you don't have a visual version of it. You are sending JSON back and forth across that. And instead of the browser keeping track of your session, your login, um, you send an API key with every request because your code is the one acting as the browser where it's saying, hey, we wanna log in as this user and do this request, send us the data back, and we don't have a cookie to store it in like we do in the browser. So we just store that in our code and we keep track of that. That's one of the first things we need to address is the authentication in building this gem. So let's go spin up a gem called Vulture and we can run bundle gem to do that. They're gonna um, spin up a gem with some things built in. So you can say, you know, do you wanna change log? Yes, we do. And this spits out a directory with files in it that we can use to get started. So every gem is going to have a gem spec. This is where you define your dependencies and all of those things. You'll need to change the summary description and a homepage and any other to-dos in here um, to make sure that those are filled out so you can actually publish this. We don't need to do that right away, but one that we do wanna um, make sure we comment out is the allowed push host. We want that to be um, allowing us to push the gem to Ruby gems. We could put that URL right in here, but we could also possibly push this to our GitHub packages as well if we wanted to do that. So by leaving this empty, we can publish the gem in, in any location. Now, one of the things that we need to do is we need our gem to make HTTP requests. And when we're building a API wrapper like this, it's nice to be able to use something that can be reused in other places. So there's a library called Faraday, which is a wrapper around the different um, HTTP clients in uh, Ruby. So Faraday Ruby, if we look that up, um, we can go to their homepage. And this is a gem that we can use if we go to their docs section to make HTTP requests. So we can go to any URL, we can grab those, we can get the status, the headers, the body, we can make delete requests, patch, put, post, um, all the typical things that you would want. So this is really nice because it allows you to make HTTP requests with an interchangeable backend. They have what are called adapters and this allows you to use net HTTP, which is built into Ruby, um, but you can also use other things like HTTP client or HTTP RB or any other um, adapters that you want. So these are maybe clients that are faster that you could interchange in the back end. but your gem can say, hey, we're just gonna use Faraday and whatever you have Faraday configured for is good. And the real benefit to this is that if we have a gem for Vulture and AWS and DigitalOcean and Linode and Hetzner, we can have five different gems that could have five different HTTP adapters, and that would be annoying. We would have five different gems making API requests. We can have all of our gems use Faraday, and then we can choose as the application owner that we want all of them to use HTTP RB or net HTTP. So that's a benefit of using Faraday for a gem like this it makes it more controllable by the application owner or the developer so they can choose, we wanna use HTTP RB for all of these 
and I can set that and you're good to go. So we need to build the requests using Faraday in our library and we're going to add spec add dependency Faraday and we're going to grab the latest version which is 1.7 right now and we're also going to add a dependency for Faraday middleware and this is going to be version 1.1. So these two gems are going to allow us to make HTTP requests, but specifically Faraday middleware, it's going to allow us to say we're going to send JSON and we're going to receive JSON and it will convert that from JSON to a Ruby hash automatically for us. So we can have those processed automatically. We don't have to write any json.parse or any of that, um, and all of that is done by the library, so our code can be a little bit simpler. So this is good, um, and we can start getting into actually building out our Vulture library. Now, by default, we're just gonna get a very simple um, Vulture module and a Vulture version file that just specifies the gem version. Simple as that. So we need to go in here and figure out what our interface is going to look like, and I like to go into the readme and go into the usage instructions and start um, exploring kind of what this might look like. I'm trying to imagine what it would look like to inter integrate with the, this library in my code. So I'm thinking we can have something like this where it's um, a Vulture client that we can create. We pass in the API key and we assign it to a variable and we can say, like client.applications, client.regions, and access those resources. And I like to go through and read other gems that I work with often. Um, and so one of those is Stripe Ruby. And this library is very nice for integrating with Stripe. And theirs works a little bit differently. They set a global API key and you can list all your customers and you never have to pass the API key around, you just set it up in an initializer and you're good to go. This is something that I originally thought about doing, but um, I decided that was not a good idea because if you're building an app like Hatchbox, we are building servers on your account with Vulture, so we'll use your API key, and we don't want a global API key because I don't want to accidentally create a server on Vulture on the wrong person's account. We wanna be very explicit about which API key it is using. So this is good to have it set up like this. Stripe works a little bit differently for that piece, but we can start thinking about, you know, what are the other methods and things that we will use. So Stripe has list for basically retrieving the index of all of the customers page by page. You can grab an individual customer with retrieve and you can do other things like update and delete as well. So we want to kind of mimic this because it's probably my favorite um, gem for an API wrapper and that's what we're going to end up doing in our code. So I think what we want to have is basically something like uh, client.applications.list, regions.list, but then we'll have something like instances.create and you'll pass in a hash of the params that are needed to create an instance. And what I would really like to get back here is a Vulture instance object. Instead of just a Ruby hash, I would prefer that this was some sort of um, class instance that has all the attributes on it that we can talk to with Ruby uh, easier. So what would be nice is if we receive an instance back, um, instead of having like instance name or instance uh, public IP, that with just a Ruby hash wouldn't be very nice to integrate with in our code, but it would be much nicer if we could say instance.name and just treat it like a regular old Ruby object. So that's what we're gonna implement so that we can do this kind of thing in our code. So let's start building the client and see if we can make an API request to one of the endpoints and just get some JSON back. That's kind of the first step that we need before we can go building out the API endpoints and the objects that we wanna return here um, that wrap those JSON responses. So let's go into our vulture.rb and what we wanna do here is we wanna auto load client from vulture client. Now, we can also do the same thing here with the error object or class, 
and we'll say vulture error. And the reason that we want to use auto load is that basically any time that the user loads the vulture gem and doesn't interact with a client or anything like that, um, that never gets loaded until it's actually used. So we can load the Ruby gem for Vulture very quickly and we don't have to load all of the files and process them when your Rails app boots um, or your Sinatra or any other app that you might be using this in. We want to be careful to make sure that this does not need you know, active support as much as we can help it um, so that we can have just a very lightweight, easy to load gem. So to use auto loading, we just need to move this class into an error.rb here. And we can paste it in and just add another module vulture and voila. So we'll kind of do the same thing for client. So we'll say client.rb and inside of here we'll have class client. It doesn't need to inherit from anything and we can start building this out. So we're going to have our initialize method with an API key and it's going to be a required parameter here. So we'll make sure that we have um, that that uh, API key that we can store and so we can say at, at API key equals API key and then one other thing that I want to do here is I want to have the adapter for the HTTP request uh, configurable and we can set that to the default adapter with Faraday so this is going to be net HTTP and we'll have that so that we can use this later on when um, we make our requests. And so this will be just helpful for us to come back to and use later. And then one nice thing that we can do is say adder reader API key and adapter and we can reference those um, from anything that's trying to access the client and might want to read the API key for whatever reason. Uh, maybe your tests want to just confirm that or whatever and it makes it easy to access that stuff. So what we can do here is we can set a base URL for our API so that all of the requests that we write in our gem just need to be relative to this um, base URL. And if we go to the docs, we can look at these and we can see um, in our examples, yeah, they're, they're just writing the relative URL here. And what that is, is based off of this api.vulture.com slash v2. So we can go and basically paste that in right here is our base URL. And then we can set up a Faraday connection to make requests. So we can say connection, and we'll set this to at connection, null equals faraday.new do connection. And Faraday knows that you can set that URL prefix, or it's a very common thing to do. So we'll set that to our base URL. And that is going to automatically be prepended to all of our requests that we make. We can then tell it that our requests are going to be in the JSON format. So whenever we send um, a body, it will convert it to JSON. And then we'll also do the same thing for response, which will take their responses and convert them from JSON to a Ruby hash. And we can set the content type to application JSON so that it knows whenever we see that content type back, we'll convert that to JSON um, and we'll be good to go. Now, last but not least, we'll set the adapter here for our uh, net HTTP or HTTP RB. Plus what's really nice about this is we can set up a stub adapter for testing. So we can come back later and fake out API request responses and use that um, adapter for testing and making sure that our requests are sending out the correct stuff and loading up the objects correctly. So we can kind of do a uh, VCR type um, interception or web mock type interception of an HTTP request, fake out the response in our code so our tests never have to hit a real production API and they can be fast and lightweight and, and quick. So this gives us enough that we can now make a connection as long as we have our um, API key. Now, in order to actually use Faraday, we're gonna want to go up here and say require Faraday and require Faraday middleware. That'll give us access to that Faraday class here. 
And one other thing I'm gonna do just for the sake of the screencast is I'm going to say inspect, and this will return a vulture client string. And that way I don't accidentally expose my API key, but we don't really need this in the actual gem, just mostly for the screencast. So one cool thing about um, this that we can use uh, for testing is actually to go into bin console and we can use this to uh, create an interactive IRB um, uh, console, but we've already loaded the vulture gem here. And we can even go as far as saying client equals vulture client dot new API key env vulture API key. So if we have an environment variable set, we can have a client ready to go and then we can interact with it automatically in bin console, which is pretty cool. So if we type bin console, we can see our client, it prints out the client um, string from inspect that I just uh, did so we don't accidentally expose our API key. Yours, if you don't include that, will show all of that. Um, and then we can go into saying client.connection.get and we can give it a URL. Now if we give it a forward slash, it's actually going to treat that as an absolute pass. So it's gonna go back to the full domain, skip the V2 in the API, and that wouldn't be great. So we want to actually just say um, a relative path here like account so that we can load that V2 accounts route and we can go and check that. Um, this is what we want to be testing. So we wanna basically say the authorization bearer with our API key and then we want to go to the slash account route um, there. So that's gonna do what we need there. We don't have any params, which is the second argument, but we do have a header that we need, which is going to go in the third argument and that is gonna be the authorization header. And we want this to be bearer and our client.api key. And that will add our header in there and make a request. And we should see that this comes back and we are all good. So what we're looking for here is the status of 200. Um, we want it to be a successful response and we get our stuff back. So for example, I have a negative balance right now because we've been testing things and I wanna, uh, or I'm going to need to actually go and pay for some stuff on my account. So we can also use dot body to get the Ruby hash version of the body. So if we say body equals that, we're gonna get the Ruby hash. So it's gonna take the body, parse it as JSON and give us a Ruby hash back. And we can interact with any of those things such as square brackets, um, account, and square brackets for name and we can get the account name. So this does work, but it is not the friendliest thing. It would be nice if we could say um, body or response dot account dot name and actually retrieve that um, ourselves. So we'll do that in the next episode. We're gonna be uh, wrapping these responses with open structs and setting all of that up. And then we'll talk about how we can organize our gem so that we can have all of those endpoints in their docs actually represented in our library. So that is it for this episode and I will talk to you in the next one. Peace.